right, I may tear up through this one. It is one of the worst nightmares out there to be arrested and convicted of a crime that you did not commit. Anthony Ray Hinton spent nearly 30 years on death row in Alabama after being wrongfully convicted of two counts of capital murder. But instead of giving into hopelessness, he somehow maintained a positive outlook until he finally won his freedom and was exonerated in 2015. He shares his experiences in the powerful memoir, The Sun Does Shine, How I Found Life and Freedom on Death Row. We are honored to have him here. Please welcome Anthony Ray Henton. Thank you for having me. This is an astonishing book. It is so good. Well, thank you. So thank you for that. Um, and I've already told you, I'm just so very sorry, because mm -hmm. I think your, your story is the story of race and class and justice. Absolutely. And injustice. Um, this is the third anniversary of your release. Yes, today is the third. Mm -hmm. um, how are you doing, first of all? How are you doing? Well, you know, uh, I'm free in one way and another sense I'm not. Uh, th three years would not undo what 30 years have done to me mentally. Uh, I still find myself being back on death row in my mind. Uh, every time the state of Alabama have an execution that whole week, I can't think of nothing but the, uh, the execution. I was right there 30 feet away from the death chamber. I know exactly what's going on. And I know exactly how the gods that treated you worse as a human being. But today, the week of your execution, they treat you like a human being. And I think about the condemned. And I ask myself every time, are you killing the right person? Because I am a proof positive that innocent people go to death row in this country every day and we execute innocent people every day. And so I ask myself every time there's an execution, did we get it right or did we get it wrong? And the problem is you can't undo this. No. And we're not perfect as human beings and the system can make mistakes. But in your case, um, this seemed like a case that should have been rectified so much earlier. I, I need to accordion this down, but mm -hmm. you were arrested and convicted of the murders of two people when you had what appeared to be an airtight alibi about where you were. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, I was arrested for first, uh, first, uh, uh, first degree attempted murder, first degree kidnap. And uh, after we got to the police station, I asked the detective, officer, what date and what time did this crime take place? And once he told me, I said, thank God. I said, well, I was at work, and thank you, Jesus, my supervisor happened to be white. I said, and here's his phone number, and you can go out there and check. And they, about four and a half hours later, they came back, and he said, uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we no longer going to charge you with first-degree robbery, first-degree kidnapping, first-degree attempted murder. And then he said, well, now the bad news is we, I don't know who we were, but we decided that we're going to charge you now with two counts of first degree capital murder. And I said, detective, I haven't killed anyone. And he said, didn't I tell you on the way here, I don't care whether you did or didn't do it. It's the same for these two crimes. I don't care, but I'm going to make sure you're found guilty of it. And so I was found guilty of a capital murder. And what bothers me to this day is that the judge stood up and said, Anthony Ray Hinton, you have been found guilty or two counts of first degree capital murder, and it is the order of this court that we sentence you to death. And then he had the audacity to say, may God have mercy on your soul. And the prosecution ran out and told the media that today the state of Alabama got the worst killer that ever walked the streets in Birmingham, but it wasn't true. And they knew it wasn't true. And what bothers me more than anything, I've always been brought up to believe in justice. I've already been brought up to believe that. My mother said, if you haven't done anything, you have no reason to lie. If you haven't done anything, you have no reason to run. Just tell the truth. And I told the truth. And I never forget the detective looked at me and he said, there's five things that are going to convict you. And he said, would you like to know what they are? And I said, yes. He said, number one, you're black. 
Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him, whether you shot him or not, I really don't care. And he said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, you're going to have an all-white jury. And he said, do you know what that spell? And he repeated the word conviction five times. And it convicted me and sentenced me to death on December 17, 1986. I went to death row, and there I stayed for 30 long years. In a cell that was how big? Five by seven. You watched how many people go by you to the death chamber that was 30 feet away? A total of 54. 54. And every time and every day, I had to go to bed with the death sentence over my head, and I woke up with a death sentence and the threat of being executed for something that the state of Alabama knew that I didn't do. And every day, the state of Alabama took a little piece of me. And that's and what no one's ever apologized or admitted no. that they were wrong. No. You were exonerated with the help of Brian Stevenson, absolutely, um, who is an amazing attorney. Uh -huh. And reading this book is such a gut wrench because you and he—it wasn't like he came in and suddenly everything was okay. No, no. You guys had these enormous disappointments, time and time and time again, until finally the charges were dropped and yes. you were exonerated. In, in part because of the gun that they claimed was yes. used had been in your mom's house, hadn't been used for 25 years, yes. didn't match, the expert who testified was wrong. Um, this should have been cleared up two weeks after you were first arrested, yes. but but wasn't. Tell me about Brian, Brian Stevenson. Well, uh, Brian Stevenson is, I call him God's best attorney. <laughs> and I had went through two attorneys and I fired one attorney because he was trying to get me a life without parole. And I told him life without parole is for guilty people, not innocent people. And I said, I'm willing to die for something that I didn't do. If the state of Alabama is hell bent on executing me for something they know I didn't do, so be it. We all must die at some point in some time, but I don't want to die for something that I didn't do. And so once I fired him, I was on my way back to my cell and there was Mr. Stevenson on TV talking about why we don't need a death penalty in this country. And I asked the God, can I stand there and listen at him a moment? And he said, yes. And for whatever reason, after hearing him talk, I knew this is the man that I need to represent me. And I wrote him a letter and then I asked him, would he consider becoming my lawyer? I said, but before you say yes or no, all I ask that you read my transcript. And if you find one thing in my transcript that point to my guilt, do not worry about becoming my lawyer. Do not send me another lawyer. I'm perfectly happy. If I have to die for something I didn't do, so be it. That's and nice. he came on and it took him what I thought would be the easy case in the world because my case dealt with ballistic and ballistic only. No fingerprints, no eyewitness, nothing. But the state of Alabama was saying that the bullets match, that the bullets they got out of the deceased body. And I told Mr. Stevens, if no two guns is alike, I already know that the state of Alabama is lying. And it took Mr. Stevenson 16 long years to finally ruin my freedom. And to me, this the worst news that I could ever a possible imagine again is that the love of my life died, my mother. And And you guys were so close. And she stayed with you. Your friend Lester came every week for all of those years. I'm so sorry. I'm, we need to think about this because this stuff gets done in our name in this country. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why do you still live in Alabama? <laughs> well, I feel that I have just as much right there than anyone else. You do, else. you do. And my mother had worked all her life to have a home built. And when I came home, since she wasn't there, I wanted to fix this old house up. And it has a connection with me and her. And I did it in her memory because she loved that. that house so much. I understand that. You write in the book about how the first night you were free, you couldn't even sleep in a bed, that you ended up in the five by seven bathroom on the bath mat because that was the only thing that felt right. Yes. And that broke my heart. Oh, 
Well, uh, my best friend uh, invited me to live with him and his wife, and and when it came down to bedtime, I felt the bed, and it was the softest thing I ever felt in my life. And I was sleeping on a, a hard little mattress, and and I tried my best to lay there, and it seemed like my heart rate was just out of control. And I said, God, I know you didn't bring me all the way this far to let me die now of a heart attack. <laughs> and so him and his wife was in the next room and I didn't want to wake them up and scare them. So I ran into the bathroom and I sat on the floor for a minute and my heart rate just began to drop. And I decided that this is where I would sleep. And I slept in the bathroom on the floor for the next two nights with that even telling them because I'm so used to this small confinement. confinement and being on the bed just didn't seem right and it didn't agree with me. Are you in a bed now? I am, but you know, I went out and I bought this king side bed and I didn't just buy any king side bed. I bought a California king side <laughs> bed and, and I had hoped to be able to just stretch out in it and sleep. But three years to this day, I haven't been able to stretch out. I still have to bring my knees up toward my chest because for 30 years I slept in a fetus position. And I wake up every morning at 2.45 because for 30 years I had to wake up at 3 a.m. for breakfast. And I find myself showering some days just like I would if I was still on death row every other day. And people see me and they say, oh, you, you look so good and you're doing so well, but they don't understand. Mentally, I'm not uh, and quite there. And that's the reality yes. of this, as happy as we are that you're exonerated and free, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing book. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's an honor to meet you, honor. and thank you. This will help us all think about the issues that are involved in your case and, and what's being done. Mm -hmm. Thank for, you so you much. Know, on all of our behalves, yes. we need to take some responsibility. Absolutely. Please visit king5.com slash newday for more information about Anthony Ray Hinton and his book, The Sun Does Shine. It can be purchased anywhere you can get books. We'll be right back. Thank you.